Galatians chapter 6, turn there please. <clears throat> Something that was interesting to me, I don't, I don't see an awful lot of stories lately about the things they're doing with DNA. And uh, it doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that they don't do anything with DNA anymore, okay? Uh, it may be that I, I, I quit going to Drudge Report. I just quit. Drudge Report, I could always count on it. I had a thing, I'd come in here every day, I'd go to Drudge Report, I would go to uh, World Net Daily, and Joseph Fair, the guy that ran World Net Daily, he went Hebrew Roots, so I quit going there. And then I would go to rents.com for all the weird stuff, like UFO, Bigfoot, all that stuff. And um, I haven't been to rents.com in a long time. I, every now and then I'll look at World Net Daily. Uh, but I just, Matt Drudge got bought out. And um, it has turned liberal, I mean, boom, just like that. And I started noticing that a while back, and I'm just going, what in the world? And sure enough, it is. So. Um, when I would, at Drudge Report, they would always give some science and technology news, and that's where I would get a lot of the stories that I based it on, some, some, some things people send in, um, but I just quit going. I go to uh, the Liberty Daily, uh, is a place that I go, uh, but it pretty much only, it's, sort of, it's modeled after Drudge Report, way too many ads, um, but they generally are dealing with political, social issues, but not so much the science. Um, and so other than that, I just don't see a whole lot. But I do believe that they are still working every day with DNA. And I think there's probably things going on after some initial discoveries were made that they're just not telling everybody. Okay? But fortunately, we have both a window into the future. We know what is going to happen. We also have a daily newspaper in the Word of God. We know what man is or could be doing right now. And when it comes to sowing seeds and then reaping those, the, the, the seeds that come from that, we can expect that this world is going to change soon. How soon? Don't know. If I were to look at it from a scientific aspect, if I were to um, just sort of examine it based on the science, uh, Ray Kurzweil came out several years ago, Time Magazine did a spread on him, and he's predicting that by, what was it, the year 20, 30, 2045? that man would be immortal. It would be, either be done through genetics or through technology where um, man would merge himself with high technology and um, he would either be able to transmit his soul into a cloud, put his soul into a big computer, store himself there, live there, it's not I don't know if it's outside the realm of possibility. Um, but anyway, that's what he predicted, 2045. We don't know that next week huge advancements could be made in science. Things that are working on, people don't know how to plug this into that. All of a sudden, they figure out it fits. And then whammy, we could be propelled ahead five to ten years. Things like that happen, especially when you believe that they're being aided and assisted by spirits. And that's what I believe. So still, if I were to say, maybe we're ten years away from man becoming immortal, from these things happening in the Bible, if I were to say that scientifically, who knows? God may release something, allow something into this world, and all of that changes literally in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So 
Is it going to happen this week, this year, this decade, probably this century? But it's going to happen. And are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Is your life in order? And if not, since you aren't the one that can put it there, you call upon the one that can. Amen? Uh, Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> we started this last Sunday morning. And you pray for me. My voice uh, is weakening today. Uh, I think my mind is tired. I know my body is tired. I rested good uh, last night and had a good time studying in the Lord. And, uh, but I'm, I'm not quite up to 100% today. So you pray for me this morning that God will help us. Amen. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. There it is. And think about what he's saying. Your God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh... Shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, just as sure as the grass came up again this spring. And we've had, you can tell, we've had, this is not a normal August for us. Usually by August, everything's brown here, like West Texas. Uh, but we've had a ton of rain, supposed to get in some more today. Um, so everything's well watered, everything's well fed, the sun's out shining, and it's going to come up, and, it's, and there's going to be a harvest, and that will happen, and there's always the if there. If we faint not. Fainting related to, think about what it is, passing out, giving up, quitting, you ever felt like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And see, I see your faces when you say that. I, I watch people while I'm teaching things. I, I look at them. And I can see in people's faces when I say, have you ever felt like quitting? It's not a yeah, it's a oh, yeah. And I can tell that their mind goes back to times. I don't know what it is. I can't read your mind. But I can sort of tell that people think of times... When they felt like giving up, felt like walking away, felt like maybe cashing it in. It's one way of saying it. Lots of people have thought that you're not the only one. Lots of people have struggled with that. Some people struggle with it. I would say probably on a weekly basis, maybe they have their good days and their bad days, but it happens. And again, if, if it was left up to our own strength, we wouldn't have made it. We wouldn't have made it this far. We wouldn't have gotten this far. But it's not our strength. It's the Lord's. Did God know what he was getting when he saved you? Yes. Can God see the future? Absolutely. He sees it like he sees everything in your past. He knows everything. And remember, the Bible says the gifts... And the callings of God are without repentance. Amen. He's not sorry that he picked you. He's not sorry that he saved you. He's not sorry that he plowed your life up, broke up the fallow ground, and planted seeds, good seeds in your life. He knows the devil came and sowed tares. He's well aware of that. And one of these days, Will, he's going to separate in, our, in my life the flesh from the soul and the spirit. There's a parting that's going to take place. He's going to gather my flesh and it's going to go the way of all flesh. Okay? But my soul and spirit's got a, new, got a date with a new body. And I, some days I'm going, today. Are you listening here? But God's got his own time. Um, in fact, while I'm thinking about this, turn to, turn to Romans. Because he mentions here, they that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. They that sow the spirit. Romans 8 is a good example. of Romans 7, always think about this. Rom Romans 6, if I have to go back to that, Romans 6, 
shows the baptism, the new life. Romans 7, it's a progression. Romans is, Paul just does everything in order. Paul's like a lawyer. In fact, I think he probably was. He was part of the, the Jewish law thing. And Paul always lays out a case like a lawyer. He's like he's got a jury. He always says, what shall we say then to these things? What is the sum of this matter? What is the conclusion that we can draw out of these facts, out of this evidence? And Romans 6 about the new life. Romans 7 is about the dual life. The fact that our flesh does things that our spirit says, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have done that. Okay? And when it comes time to repent, that was your soul. That was not your flesh. Flesh is not sorry. Flesh is always seeking out more to lust after, more to lust to be fulfilled, more pride in itself. And the soul is chastened of God and God responds to that. So then Romans 8, 8 is number for new beginnings, new life. So he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. And I wish I could take some people and just shake them really good and say the law, you're trying to follow the law and the law can't do it. The law is weak because the law deals with the flesh. And the flesh is incredibly... And, and here again... I've mentioned a young man, I'm not going to say his name, I'm, I'm just praying for him. But he, on the, I know the leadership of his mother-in-law has turned Hebrew roots. Out of this church, turned Hebrew roots. Okay? And I know him well enough to know that I know what it stems from. Pride. It's always about the pride of what I do. Look at what I keep. I am keeping this law. I am keeping these laws. Never an admittance of what he doesn't keep, but a boasting of what they do keep and what they do perform. And that's exactly why Paul said what he said. Lest we should boast, lest any man should boast. For verse 3, for the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, but without sin and for sin, but without sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Let me do this. Let me ask you a question. If you were to pick one, you know, the, the crucifixion of Christ is full of symbolism. So if you were to pick one symbol of the crucifixion that you think pointed toward Christ condemning sin in his flesh, what would you pick? I mean, I know what I see in my mind, but what is it about the crucifixion that speaks that Christ nailed our sins to his cross? The nails. Okay. It wasn't what I was thinking, but that's, that's pretty good. Okay. So the nails pierced. Um, Colossians. He's taken the ordinances that were against us, nailing them to his cross. But Ellen White said that it was all the ordinances except the fourth commandment. Because an angel told her that the fourth commandment was not nailed to the cross. And I'm going, so see, Paul said, if an angel from heaven comes down and brings you any other gospel, let him be accursed. Yes, ma'am. It's exactly what I was thinking of. The first thing God told Adam, and it's, it has to do with sowing and reaping. And he said, you're going to sow in your field and you're going to reap thorns and thistles. It will bring forth. And I got home yesterday, Gary, and I'm looking at my flower bed and I'm going, those stupid things. Coming back up again, but that flower bed is my life. Always there. Pull them out, get rid of them. There they are again. Maybe I should get cleaner dirt next time, Sterling. Because that dirt was loaded with it. Yes, David. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. What did the Bible say? He tasted death. And is death pleasant or is death bitter? Very bitter. Very bitter. Okay, Gary. Yeah. Blood and water. And that's what the sign was. Brandon? I was going to say uh, his shed blood, the blood that he shed on the cross. Right. Yes, ma'am. The stripes. The stripes. Yeah. By his stripes, we are healed. Um, but the, the thorns of sin, the, the sting of death. Paul said he had a thorn in his flesh. Yes, Lisa. The words. Okay. Yeah, Father, forgive them. Okay. So yeah, a lot, there's a lot there. Um, but he literally took our sins upon himself, nailing them to his cross to take them where? Out of the way, the Bible says. Okay. So what was sown into us by this world, by the devil, um, God destroyed it. God got rid of it. He's going to gather it up on these days, bury it in the ground, burn it up with fire, and that's going to be the end of it. Uh, you know one of my favorite verses, Psalm 139? Yeah, go ahead. Last Thursday morning, God woke me up. I don't know what I had me got. He actually knocked me out of bed. Whoa. It sounds terrible, but I, I rolled out of bed. I fell, I fell out of bed and I thought, okay, I got it. And I was going out here going to a Just wake up here. Amen. He'll do it. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. Psalm 139. He said in verse 14, I will praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Then verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect. Uh, here's what's interesting. If you know a little bit about uh, Jewish mythology, um, the Jews have this story about the creation of an artificial man. Now think, think science here. Because that's what we're doing. We're creating an artificial man. But the Jews had this myth, this urban legend, I guess, as it were, of creating what they called a golem, G-O-L-E-M. And uh, a certain Hebrew rabbi in the 1500s in Prague told this story about a rabbi making a man out of clay and then writing a, like a Hebrew word on his forehead. Think about that. And all of a sudden that brought him to life. And then to take away his life, he just would wipe the word off of his forehead and that would kill him. Okay. Well, the word golem for that primitive, crude, artificial man that they made is the word that's translated in your King James yet being unperfect. It's the only, it's the only time it, it shows up in the Bible is that it's yet being unperfect. But to me, what's interesting is the Jews have this idea of creating an artificial man and giving him life. Ooh. Revelation 13. They're going to create an image of the beast, an artificial life form, and he is going to be given life. And he's going to speak autonomously, not like Siri. Siri has programmed responses. But soon, artificial intelligence will take over those responses and Siri will generate her own responses to your questions. Okay? I still don't talk to Siri or Alexa or Hey Google. I don't talk to them. And I grew up watching Star Trek where they talk to the computer and I would be going, that would be so cool. But I'm... Growing up now and I'm going, I ain't saying a word. And all the time I do something with my watch and it hits the button and all of a sudden my watch saying, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. 
And I'm going, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> so that, anyway, that's me talking to it. But at some point, this life, this artificial life form is going to give a response back that it thought of. Which shows desire and will. And computers don't have that right now. But we're teaching them how to. We're teaching them how to have their own, to make their own choice. Google created, or a lab created this artificial robot dog. And the video on the internet shows these guys kicking the dog. And it was programmed to recover from that and keep walking. And I thought about that. At what point does the dog not want to be kicked anymore? That shows desire. And at some point, the artificial dog says, don't kick me again. And by that point, who will be like unto the beast? And who will be able to make war with him? It won't happen. Anyway, back to uh, in thy book, DNA. Four letters, four base pairs, just like the two rungs of DNA, the Old and New Testament, the four the four um, base pairs joining together and whatever sequence that is, it's like Morse code, dots and dashes, or binary code for programming computers. Um, the combination of those spell out the 22 amino acids, which are the 22 Hebrew letters of the Old Testament. And whatever combination that comes in, that's what determines what life that has. And that led me to understand several years ago, after God had already said, Mike, this King James is right, trust it. And so I started trusting it like I never had before. And then it occurred to me, Mike, this was the Bible you got saved with. This is what a missionary to France, who was preaching the week of Bible camp that I was at, and I responded to his preaching and he was preaching out of King James, the pastor that came down, I don't remember who it was, but there's my mom and I knelt. My mom's got her arm around me, she's crying, I'm crying. And the pastor I know is reading King James because this is the 70s, that's all it was. And everybody was using the same Bible. So God sowed these words into my life and it formed a new man. And I didn't understand all that then, like I understand it now, but I believed it. And that's what it takes. You don't have to be the smartest egg in the basket. Okay? Brightest lamp in the, or brightest bulb in the lamp. You don't have to be. You just believe what God said, every word of it. And he sows those things and what he speaks into us, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if God sows it, it comes up. It happens. Which in continuance were fashioned. Because Brother George, is he done with you yet? Is God done with you yet? And I like Brother George. But I see his face sometimes when I preach. And I can tell God deals with him. God's speaking to him. And that means that God's not done with him. And he's not done with me either. So he's still fashioning me. Whose image am I going to be in? Christ's image. You know, they say at some point in embryonic development... When the embryo, a human embryo is in a mother's womb, it doesn't look any different than that of a dog. The embryos look almost identical. But let it be fashioned some more. God's not done with it yet. And maybe, maybe some of my pastor friends that I've known all my life, some men that I looked up to as a young man, Maybe they didn't see back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s what these new translations, what was going to be spawned from those. But hopefully they can start to see it now. Because if the vine is not the true vine and it's the vine of Sodom, then can we not see that it is producing grapes of gall and clusters that are bitter? Can we not see that it's producing the fruit of Sodom? And that's the point. If it was sown, 
You can put your money down on the table that it's going to be reaped. It is going to happen. That's the harvest that's coming in. Uh, so in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And again, years ago, these new Bibles started showing up. We didn't see the immediate effect. We didn't see the difference. We didn't see that it was going to have any purpose. But I can remember back in my days at Bible College in Moore, Oklahoma, I could see back then there was one church that I knew of. And it was sort of a liberal church, a free will Baptist church. But they were using the NIV all the way back in 1985, 86. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't think that's right. I think they ought to use the King James. I don't think they ought to go to that. I just don't trust that NIV. And that was all the way back then when they were trying to talk me out of what was in the Bible. So all the way back then, I just felt that that just wasn't right. But I couldn't know exactly why. Well, now... I see it. I get it. And I wouldn't even begin to wonder where that church is now as far as what they stand for and what they believe. Because it was bad enough in 85 that I didn't go there. So anyway, um, Psalm 126, verse 5. They that, oh, I love this. This is what God gave me the night before I committed my daddy's seed to the ground. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. When God says shall, what does that mean? And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. If you go to bearingpreciousseed.org, that's where we buy Bibles from. It's an independent Baptist church in Ohio. And they print their own. They, God gave them a ministry. To, they got the printing presses. They got all the stuff. And they print their own Bibles there. And um, King James, it's all that is, King James Bibles. And God bless them for that. But bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And God, there in that hotel room down in Arkansas, God said, Mike, you're not burying your dad. You're plowing and planting in hope. In hope that you're going to see him again. I don't put too much stock in dreams, but I had a dream not too long after my dad died. And the wall of my office, I have pictures of my dad and the job that he did. He worked right, up, right over here on the other side of this hill is the Mississippi River. And he worked as a river man. His job was to sound out the river channel for barge traffic and he worked on a dredging operation, Corps of Engineers dredging operation. And in my dream, my dad was working and he came up missing. Well, if you go up missing from that boat, they look in the water. And it, it was bothering me that my dad, he fell in. And that happened to couple of guys he worked with they fell in and then I remember toward the end of my dream I looked was at the riverbank and I saw my dad walking but he was young like I remember him as a child I never forgot about that and those people that you planted in hope with tears you will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing those sheaves with you. Amen. This Bible's right. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 4 3 For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. What is fallow ground? What is that? It's an unplowed 
field. Unplowed. Because everybody knows if you're going to plant, you got to break that ground up. Got to turn it over. First thing, you go out in Lancaster County or Ohio, and it's fun to watch those Amish farmers with a 20 mule team plowing with mules, big horses, big old things, turning that dark, rich soil completely over. Okay? Then they break it up. Break up those clods, he said. Break up that fallow ground. A lot of times in the ministry, what I understand as a pastor, as a teacher, as a preacher, what I have to do is a lot of times people come to us very broken. The world has had devastating effects in their lives and maybe they still think the ways of the world. And I've experienced that. And what I understand a lot of times is that the word of God, this is where I talk about taking your sword and beating it into a plow, is that the sword then has to be used to break up the hardened thoughts and the hardened philosophies that they've gained over their life. Where maybe the word of God will change them and bring about good results in their life, but sometimes I can't be easy on people as I'm preaching to them. Because breaking up hard ground is never done softly. You think about it. It is a hard thing to break up hardened, old, stony ground. It's a hard thing to do. And sometimes... I, and God taught me this. Reg Kelly, first time I heard you heard me, I, first time I heard him preach, I hated his guts. So angry at that man for saying what he was saying and preaching how he was preaching. But God showed me, Mike, that's a plow. That's a country plow boy who knows that we're going to have to, even amongst us preachers, that man knew that some of the hardest ground in the world is in preachers. I'm telling you. Because we're the last ones to change our minds about anything. And God has to plow that up and break that up in our mind and our, the way we see the world and just bust us wide open. Then he gently drops those seeds in place. Then God speaks soothe, smooth words to us, soft words. And then he says, now we can do it. And then it takes somebody to water that. Sometimes the preaching is just watering. Things you've already heard before, right? Amen. But I'm going to say it again. I'm going to stir them up in your mind. You've heard me teach about DNA before, but I'm going to say it again. About time for me to do another DNA video. Amen? But just get the word out fresh and remind people of these things. A lot of the stuff that I said this weekend, I've said before. But it's good to be reminded of it. Amen? And that's always going to come up. Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and do what? Rain righteousness upon you. And that's exactly what I just said. And it's quarter till. Nobody ring the bell. On cue. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me today, all right? Father, thank you, dear God, for bringing us together in your house. Thank you for these people. Bless them, Lord. Bless their lives. Break up some hard ground in our lives. Change us. Make us into your image. Sow some good things in us. Sow some good things to be reaped in our lives. We're depending on you, Father, to do that for us because we don't know how to do it ourselves. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.